Hello everyone and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. -on -one. Singularity One-on-One -on -one is a feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Socrates and as always I will be the man with the questions. Today I'm privileged to have Dr. Max Moore as my guest on the show. Dr. Max Moore has a very distinguished and very long resume, so perhaps the quickest way to introduce him is by using the words of two other great futurists and thinkers. Marvin Minsky, the father of artificial intelligence, said of Dr. Moore, we have a dreadful shortage of people who know so much, can both think so boldly and clearly, and can express themselves so accurately. Carl Sagan was another such one, and partly by paying the price of his, his life, managed to capture the public eye. But Sagan is gone and has not been replaced. I see Max as my candidate for that post. In addition, Ray Kurzweil said of Max Moore, Max Moore's ideas are very influential among other big thinkers, who in turn, who in turn are influenced leaders themselves. Max's writings represent well-grounded science futurism and reflect a sophisticated understanding of technology trends and how these trends are likely to develop during this coming century. So, hi Max and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. -on -one. Thank you for having me. Should I refer to you as Socrates? Uh, you can call me name? Socrates or Nick. Uh, my uh, viewers and listeners are well aware of my alias. Okay. Um, the reason I use the alias Socrates is because I usually restrain my participation with the raising of the questions and I provide all the, the opportunity for my guests to, to supply the answers. Okay. <laughs> um, so let me start this interview by asking you perhaps to share a little bit more about yourself and your background but especially how and got how and and why you got interested in issues such as philosophy and ethics in general and transhumanism and the singularity in particular okay um, well philosophy I started I suppose reading philosophy just before my teens maybe my very early teens um, but largely actually through psychology and then getting into philosophy but my first real love intellectually I suppose was economics um, and I was I read huge amounts of economics, uh, devoured the textbooks before I even studied it at school. Uh, but after a few years, I started exploring the questions that underlay economics. Uh, if I had to write an essay, for instance, on the proper role of government in the economy, uh, then that raised not just economic questions, but questions of political philosophy. Uh, when you start thinking about political philosophy, you start thinking about ethics. What are the ethical foundations of uh, political systems? Why do I have any obligation to obey the law, or do I? Uh, which laws, depending on how they're promulgated, who, who sets them up? So that started me thinking about ethics, and then once you start thinking about ethics, you have to think about epistemology. How do we know things? How do we know things in the area of ethics? And so you, you know, start with this little small area, and it suddenly starts expanding to encompass the entire universe. And that's what philosophers do in their arrogance. They have something to say about everything. Uh, they talk about everybody else's discipline and its methodological foundations. Um, uh, they talk about the status of the different sciences and the social sciences and what people can know. So uh, you know, philosophers really uh, think they're experts on pretty much everything at some abstract level. So that's how I got into philosophy. But for me, uh, I think coming from the economics background and my particular interests had always been a transhumanist in some form or another before the word was being used. To me, philosophy was about answering questions that I care about. It wasn't just an academic discipline where I want to get a PhD, so I have to study this, I have to study Kant, I have to study Hume, I have to study metalogic. Um, some of those things I didn't want to do, frankly. I never liked studying Kant. I'm not good at uh, mathematical logic. I managed to get through it. Uh, but for me, it was all about how do I answer the big, big issues in life? What's the right thing to do? What kind of life is worth living? Um, what's right and wrong? What's the best way to, to organize our society? Uh, how can I know what's right and wrong? I actually, I remember, I still have a vivid memory, one of my earliest philosophical memories from when I was maybe 16, 15, 16. I had read, um, I'd been reading some Hume. Actually, I think I was reading Bertrand Russell describing Hume's views. And I still distinctly remember walking along the street outside my home, really worrying, fretting, saying, how can I know that any of this is real? All I know is my sense impressions. I can't get beyond those. All of this could be an illusion, which, of course, today we still talk about. Now we call it the simulation argument, uh, a more modern version of that skeptical argument. Or the uh, so brain I took it very, very seriously. Yeah, the brain and the vet. Yeah. 
So I took those questions very seriously, and I'd always been driven into philosophy by answering things that I thought were important. And that's also why I ended up not becoming an academic, because the vast majority of philosophy that I've seen seems to me not to answer important questions. It seems to get uh, burrows into trivia, into very teeny technical issues that in the end don't really amount to very much. And uh, you can still do important philosophy, and there are people doing philosophy that's relevant to life. But uh, I suppose I felt that wasn't really the direction I wanted to go in. So uh, how did you make the, the sort of the move? Once you realized that philosophy is not the direction that you wanted to go in, how did you make the transition or the move into uh, transhumanism and some of your uh, later um, engagements, such as the founding of the Extropy Institute and, and your current position as the CEO of the Alcor Foundation? Well, it wasn't really um, the way you put it makes it sound like I dropped philosophy and moved on to transhumanism and other things, but these are actually all happening at the same time. Uh, again, really, if someone asks you, asked me, when did you start being a transhumanist, that's a very tough question to answer because, you know, the term wasn't being used until, uh, until really around 1990 or so when I published the essay on transhumanism. It had been used by Huxley and even Dante, arguably, if you go far back, but nobody had, was using those terms. Those had been forgotten until we more recently discovered them. And yet, uh, from the age of five, I was watching the Apollo moon launches. Uh, I was, as a, as a child, I was making uh, designs for rocket boots, like a flight of the moon. Um, I was fascinated by science fiction where people live longer uh, or super intelligent. Um, I'd always been fascinated by those ideas in one form or another. So I think I was at least a proto-transhumanist, you know, pretty much always, as far as I can tell. Uh, so and when who I were your heroes when you were a child and you were inspired? Was it the astronauts who were the first people on the moon or...? I think astronauts were definitely uh, my, you know, some of my first heroes. And just like probably many, many boys in the late 60s, early 70s, if you ask them, what do you want to do? Well, I want to be an astronaut. <laughs> and I would have certainly said that back then. Um, because I, I think one thing is that getting off the planet, it represents a fundamental part of, of the extropian view of things, the extropic vision of overcoming limits. Uh, the planet's pretty big, but it doesn't seem so big these days. Uh, being able to leave the planet, get out of our gravity well, create new societies off-planet, uh, that seems like part of our future, and it's one way of breaking limits. And that really became part of the, the idea of you know, you know, the extropy idea. And then combining that with the ideas of removing limits to human intelligence, to human creativity, uh, improving ourselves emotionally, those all came together to find, form really the, sort of the core of the principles of extropy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the Apollo people were my early heroes. And then um, once I got into life extension, which was in my early teens, um, I suppose I was for a while there a big fan of Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw because of their huge volume uh, life extension, a practical scientific approach, which, you know, I think is full of really bad advice now. But uh, <laughs> it was still a fascinating book and it was very detailed and impressive at that age. Um, probably another hero I would mention would be Douglas Hofstadter. Um, I read his book, Godel Escher Bach, when I was 16 or 17. That was a really challenging read, but that also introduced a lot of important ideas. Now, uh, you did mention um, your sort of seminal 1990 essay, Transhumanism Toward a Future Philosophy, a Futurist Philosophy. So perhaps it is best to uh, lay a little bit of the foundation for our discussion by going into the terms that we're going to be using and their meaning, because there's a lot of disagreement or misperception of the meaning of the term. So let's start with transhumanism. What, in your view, is transhumanism? Well, of course, you ask each transhumanist, you'll get a slightly different answer, sometimes a, a very different answer. Recently, the way I've liked to put it is to simplify it into two, two related ideas. And I think sometimes one aspect of this gets emphasized at the expense of the other. Transhumanism, you can think of as both transhumanism and as transhumanism. Now, to explain that, uh, transhumanism implies that it really emphasizes the idea that the human condition is not the final word, as Freeman Dyson put it. I think he said it's a marvelous beginning, but not the final word. Uh, the idea that human biological limits are not inviolate, they're not, uh, they're not sacrosanct, um, there's something to be respected in terms of making changes in a complex system, we have to be careful, but really the whole process of history has been 
uh, increasing complexity and human beings learning to overcome their limits. And why on earth shouldn't that include our own internal limits, our biological, genetic, neurological limits? So the, the transhumanism part emphasizes that idea of overcoming uh, the limitations of humanity. On the other hand, I think it's also important to emphasize, again, from the philosophical background, this, I stress this, uh, the transhumanism, the idea that transhumanism didn't just appear out of nowhere, it has intellectual and cultural roots. And the way I see it is it's really the heir to the enlightenment, to enlightenment humanism. It has the same ideas of, uh, of progress, and there are different interpretations of that. Transhumanists don't, well, usually don't believe in inevitable progress, you have to work hard at it. Uh, it usually includes a kind of a secular notion that whether or not there is a higher being out there, and I, I personally see no reason to believe there is, but if, even if there is, it's really up to us to make the future happen. We can't just sit back and wait for a higher being to do it, um, which is kind of interesting because now we have uh, not just divine beings, we have people suggesting that artificial intelligence will solve our problems unless it destroys us. Um, but the humanist, um, humanist ideas of, of progress, of inclusion of everybody to the extent we can, of trying to not just push ahead ourselves, but to bring up the people who may be behind to improve the conditions for everybody, just because that's a decent thing to do. And because actually, it's, I think really it's in our long-term self-interest that everybody is a part of the future. Uh, so a lot of those, those humanist ideals, including the idea that we should reject arbitrary distinctions that don't matter. And I think transhumanists are very good at that. We, we are very, uh, it's not even an issue if someone is gay, uh, if they're transgender, what race they are. I've never seen that as an issue at all in transhumanist circles. Uh, it just, it would be ludicrous to, you know, to be sexist or racist or biased against those people when you're talking about transforming the entire body and mind. That would be just crazy. Um, so I think the, emphasizing the humanist tradition of, of uh, you know, enlightenment ideals of progress, of goodwill, of creating our own future, uh, and using reason and science coupled with goodwill, I think that's a crucial part of transhumanism too. So um, uh, how does transhuman, transhumanism relate to your work or the founding of the Extropy Institute and uh, potentially the Extropy principles that you just that you mentioned? Well, we started X3 Magazine, actually, first of all, uh, myself and uh, my friend Tom, uh, Tom Morrow, as he preferred to call himself, back in 1988, when we were students, graduate students at the University of Southern California. And the word transhumanism wasn't being used then. Transhuman was. FM 2030 used the term transhuman, but he didn't uh, put it into a philosophical context and have transhumanism or any principles based on it. Uh, so in 1988, the essential core of it uh, I have to give a, a hat tip to Timothy Leary, I suppose, because he was a bit of an inspiration in a, in, a, in a small way in that he had this formula, which I still rather like, the SMILE formula, uh, S-M-I squared L-E, spelling out SMILE, um, <laughs> two over the I. And that gets the essence of you know, some of those early ideas, space migration, intelligence increase, and life extension. So it doesn't hit all the points, but it, it gets at the core of them. So the concept of extropy, essentially, a uh, term that Tom actually coined, not me, uh, is this idea of, of uh, increasing order, progress, complexity, uh, overcoming limits in every direction. So that included those things of space, intelligence, uh, extending our lifespans, but also a lot of other things. So we started that magazine um, and then founded the Extropy Institute a few years later. And I think it was 1990 that, or 1989 that that essay came out, uh, talking about transhumanism and critiquing religion. Uh, and that uh, you know, became the Institute, it became a set of conferences, online forums, I think we still have one of the it's one of the oldest surviving forums. The, we now call it Extraby Chat, but that's uh, that's almost two decades old now. It's a very old email list. Mm -hmm. So the goal there really was to bring together these ideas. A lot of people were discussing space space systems. Some people were talking about life extension, some cryonics, um, but there weren't many people actually in one place talking about all these ideas together and how they interrelated. And that was my interest, and that uh, attracted a lot of other people. Um, even before the internet existed, uh, or I should say before the web existed, um, brought them together to, because they were of like mind. I would get calls from people in uh, you know, far countries or in obscure parts of the United States who couldn't talk to anybody about these crazy ideas. And when they saw the magazine being reviewed in Wired magazine or some underground publication, they would call me up or, or write to me and they were very excited. I thought I was the only person who thought this way. And they're so relieved to actually find a community.